for you here, you can see money market instruments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's just write quickly capital market instruments, okay? Capital market instruments. Uh, this is, uh, again, financial economics. Now it's already number nine, okay? Financial economics, number nine, capital market instruments. Let's just make a nice, quick, clean list so that you have something to kind of like number one, two, three, four, five. And number one will be treasury. So number one. Treasury. Notes. And bonds. The main difference from treasury bill is that treasury note and bond is a long-term instrument. Second, it usually has a coupon. So let's write out coupon. Because it's a long-term instrument, has a very, very, very high interest rate risk. Of course, it is subject to inflation risk, currency risk, and all the other risks, okay? Maturity between two and 30 years, okay? That's it. Number two. Mortgages. And it's simply a loan to an individual or business or corporation secured by real estate, usually to buy real estate. That's it. We've studied this already a few times. Number three. Municipal bonds. We already studied this before. It is simply a bond issued by a local government, like a state or municipality. That's all there is to it. Number four, corporate bonds. simply bond issued by a corporation. Next one is a lease. Uh, they actually mean, because there are two types of leases, one is called operating lease, the other one is called capital lease. They here really mean to say capital lease, and capital lease is effectively very similar in economic nature to a loan for the purchase of equipment. In the sense a loan to buy, let's say, a tractor, to buy a taxi, and something like that. In a lease, and here is now where I'm trying to explain the difference. Legally, legally, the lender remains the owner of the asset, legally. So the bank will like lend you 30,000. You will buy a taxi, the car with 30,000, okay? But you will use the car, you will have the option to buy after five years. You'll be repaying it, or when you pay it off, 
the car becomes yours, but technically and legally, while you're paying the lease, the car is in the name of the lender. Okay, that's very important. It simply means you stop paying your lease payment, the bank comes and takes their car. It's their own car. They don't have to go through courts, they don't have to go through complications. They all probably already have the key. They just come in, get the car, and that's the end of the story. It's their car anyway, okay? So that's a lease. Effectively, it is. The economic meaning is a loan by the lender to the borrower for the purchase of the asset, let's say the tractor or the car. But legally, the lender still owns it, and the transfer occurs only when the lease is fully paid off, okay? And that's the way it works. Next one is preferred stock. Well, if you got a preferred stock, it simply means that the corporation guarantees you a particular dividend payment well, on that particular stock and common stockholders cannot get any dividend until the preferred gets paid, okay? So, they get the preferred payment on the dividend, okay? And usually might say 7% dividend, okay? And 7% on the par value, they're going to be paying you $2 dividend. And that's it. Hello. We still have in class. We haven't finished yet. Okay? So, that's preferred stock. And now we get to number seven. Common stock. In common stock will be share of ownership. We already studied that. Now, we can simply say that to the extent that we can classify these. Oh, geez. Okay, here's what I'm thinking here. Oh, I forgot. This is, represents equity market and equity instruments. Equity. instruments and these are mostly debt instruments all right Zach cameraman let's go back to financial markets uh, I'm moving over here remember we had a spot market Futures market, money market, capital, primary, secondary, right? Private, public, physical, financial. You also have debt markets. Definition is a financial market where debt instruments are traded. We also like to say where fixed income instruments are traded, okay? Both are good. And the other one is called equity markets. And equity markets is a financial market where equity instruments are traded. We can also say where instruments of ownership are Trade. Sometimes, instead of equity markets, they have another simple name, which is pretty much exactly the same. They simply call it stock market. And instead of a debt market, they sometimes just like to call it bond market. which is, as we studied already, exactly the same as fixed income market.
Okay? So, I'm repeating again for all of you, debt market is the same as bond market, is the same as fixed income market, there aren't any major difference or any differences at all. Okay, so these are the markets, these are the capital market instruments, and capital market instruments we divide into debt and equity. In between debt and equity, we have one special type which I covered early on. Let me write it in red over here. It's called hybrid instruments. And a hybrid instrument is a financial instrument that has characteristics of both debt and equity at the same time. Okay. Both debt and equity at the same time. And hybrid instruments are two most common. Number one hybrid instrument is the preferred stock because the preferred part gives you a fixed dividend, okay, and the other one I'll have to kind of like squeeze it in here and I'll write it in blue just to make a difference so because it's getting messy, it's called convertible bond, convertible bond, so I'm repeating again, hybrid instruments are instruments with characteristics of both debt and equity. The two most common, most popular, and most important hybrid instruments are the convertible bond, which is a bond with characteristics of stock, of equity, and the preferred stock, which is a stock with the characteristic of bond. Okay, that fairly clear? Okay, uh, and that finishes uh, this part. Okay, I'm here thinking of doing another little trick. Rather than get financial institutions, which can take a full hour, I can cover here on page 128, so we can finish for today, without beginning financial institutions, and next time we can cover in great detail properly financial institutions. 128 is called recent trends. And other recent trends, I got about eight, ten trends that I well, can and want to cover for you. So let's do this here. Before we get to institutions, so that you need to understand what's been going on in recent years in financial markets, institutions, and instruments. So, trends. And let's begin one by one. First one is techno technology, okay? Technology. Everything in financial market today is done with computers. Everything's done electronically. You can make an electronic order, you can buy electronically, sell electronically. You have uh, electronic trading platforms, okay? You have everything's done with technology. Now, people love to use their iPhone to buy stocks, to sell stocks. They use their iPhone, they connect to their online broker, they make an online order, they have an online order. So, technology and let's add another keyword, computerization, computerization. Has been a dominant driver in global financial markets over the last 30 or 40 years, okay? Part of the technology and computerization is the 
most recent trend of webifying. Webification means everything is happening on the internet. You can go, you can check stock prices, bond prices, oil prices, and anything. You can buy stocks, sell stocks, or futures, or options, or whatever. Everything's happened on the internet. So the internet has become the latest, very dominant trend in financial markets, financial institutions, and investing. The second one, which we studied a great, great, great length, is globalization. Competition is global. You have global financial centers. Let's repeat those financial centers again. New York, London, Tokyo, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh-uh, new one, Shanghai, okay? Rising and for sure to rise above most of the others, okay? So globalization also means more in transaction, inter international transactions, like more international sales, more international lending, more international buyers, more international sellers. As soon as the size of transaction goes up, for example, uh, let's say Acer wants to make a $5 billion investment, they can't sell it $5 billion here. They gotta sell it globally. They're gonna use markets in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Tokyo, and they're gonna be selling in a lot of different ways. So globalization is extremely important modern trend over the last 20 or 30 years and we studied it as part of the global financial crisis. When we studied as a global financial crisis, we had a special part to globalization which we called interconnectedness or interdependence. When things go wrong in Greece, the New York stock market crashes, okay? In 1997, the global financial crisis, sorry, the Asian financial crisis here, like in Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Taiwan, later on Korea, showed you that things are related. One country falls, which was number one Thailand, and just a few weeks later the next country falls, and then the next one. And then six months later, out of the blue, Russia falls, and then Argentina falls on the other side of the world. And then you have a major hedge fund in the United States, which it's called long-term capital management. If it goes bankrupt, could easily bring down the U.S. financial system. So things are connected because of globalization. Okay. Now, because of globalization, we have one other extremely important trend which we've been seeing during the Asian financial crisis in 97, 98 and especially in the last three or four years, we call it contagion. And contagion is simply spreading a disease from a sick person to a healthy person, okay? And in finance, we call it uh, okay, let me delete this. We call it financial contagion. Or simply contagion, where crisis spreads from one country to the next country. The first country to fall back in the old days was Ireland. Ireland got in big trouble, and as soon as Ireland got in trouble, they said, uh oh, who's next? Well, but that, that's all. When somebody gets in trouble, they always want to look 
to who's the next, and the next is Portugal. Portugal is next in travel. And then the next is uh, Greece in travel. And after Greece is now, uh oh, Italy in travel. As soon as Italy got in travel, they say, oh, if Italy is in travel for sure, this means that, I'm oh, sorry, France is in trouble. Suddenly, say, oh my God, the whole European continent is in trouble. But it goes beyond that. If Europe is in trouble, this means that soon enough, China's gonna be getting in trouble because China is selling all their stuff to Europe. And of course, the US, okay? So, well, but if China's in trouble, Taiwan's in trouble, okay? So you see how the problem, meaning contagion basically means that a problem or a crisis is spreading from one market to the next and from one economy to the next economy. And that's been very common and important trend in the last decades, okay? Let's see what else we have. Number three. Number three is straightforward, deregulation. And we studied at great length in the other class that there has been a general trend over the last 20, maybe 30 years, since the 80s, okay, or late 70s, to deregulate financial markets. So financial markets regulate themselves. They call it self-regulation. And governments don't involve and say, hey, you guys take care of your own business, okay? So that's been an important part of financial markets. One example I gave you was with the CD market and the euro dollar market and other things. And if in one market is heavily regulated, the other one is unregulated, uh, you know, business will fall from the regulated to the from the more regulated to the less regulated market. So deregulation has been an important trend in global financial markets and institutions. And now it appears, because it's been only two or three years, and we can't say for sure, that deregulation now, uh, let, 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 let me write it like this. From 1980 until uh, 2008, that's the global financial crisis. It appears, but we can't know for sure because it's been bad in two or three years, that the latest trend is of re-regulation. Can you guys close and hear that door? Re-regulation, which is a trend of regulating more or reintroducing more regulation in the market. So deregulation is lowering regulation, re-regulation is increasing regulation in financial markets. Next one. Oh yeah, with deregulation, number four is competition. Hong Kong, Singapore, before that, Tokyo, now Shanghai. Europeans want to get a piece of the pie, like Frankfurt, okay, and some, maybe the Swiss, Zurich, and so on. So, everybody wants to make money, and they're all competing, and competition brings efficiency and a whole bunch of other things, but the market is increasingly more competitive global market. And competition is a result of three things. The first is deregulation. As long as governments regulate less, there's going to be obviously more competition. The second is, of course, globalization. Now, you got to compete with Hong Kong oh, and Shanghai and Singapore and all the others, okay? And, of course, the first one is Technology. You can easily communicate now with the internet, with web, and everything else. It's very easy for me to make, let's say, investments from Saudi Arabia to the United States and then from Taiwan, I don't know, to Bulgaria, okay, or Hong Kong, or 
Macau or Bahrain. Okay, Bahrain is a major banking center. Okay, so competition is based on technology, globalization, and deregulation. Okay, the next one I already covered: international linkage, meaning contagion and interconnectedness. Yes. Next one. Let's pull this up and see if I can do this. Yes, I can do this. Number five. And number five is complexity. Complexity. Financial instruments get more and more and more complex with more features, with more options, with backup lines, with insurance, credit default swaps, counterparties. So everything gets extremely complex. Financial markets, so the instruments are getting complex. Financial markets are also getting more complex too, in interconnected and can trade from country to country. So things are getting harder to understand, okay? And complexity requires that you study and learn more and better finance if you want to have a finance job and to be competitive in the finance job market. Complexity requires more work, more study, more knowledge, deeper understanding, ability to think, and analyze because not everything is knowledge. When you graduate and you hear the next important instrument, you're going to be able, you have to, you will not know it. It's a brand new instrument. You will have to be able to analyze and understand complexity. Okay? And part of complexity or result of complexity is goes jointly, is called innovation financial innovation. And financial innovation has two, I mean, it is, the theory of financial innovation is extremely complicated and we got a very simple and very easy story for first, second, third year undergraduate student is that you innovate, the first primary reason is to fit or find a better product for the customer. In other words, to fit investor needs. So the investors want to have a specific product and they just deliver it to them. They want to have a little longer term product or a little shorter term product or more secure or less secure. So to meet meet investor needs. That's the first one because investors change over time. Sometimes they're younger, sometimes they're older, sometimes they want more risk and more return. Other times they want more safety. Okay? And the other one is regulation to avoid, sometimes we call it evade regulation, but here's to avoid regulation. Avoid means that you legally avoid it. In other words, you legally construct a new financial instrument which is not subject to regulation and therefore you can use it legally and there is no problem because there's no legal problem okay the example which we studied in the other course of great detail was exactly the CDS credit default swap and credit default swap was an unregulated market of course they it wasn't regulated and they wanted it unregulated and they lobbied to keep it unregulated. But that's a great financial innovation that was 
you know, effectively avoided regulations on capital and capital requirements. The trick was you can write insurance without the required capital. That was beautiful for the bankers while it worked and while they connected the collected the insurance premium. When these blew up, they didn't have the capital, they blew up. So innovation is mostly to meet needs and to avoid regulation. Seven, speed. Global financial markets, financial institutions, and financial players have become fast, very fast, fast trading markets. Traders moving fast in the markets, move fast out of the market. They say, we need $5 billion. They say, no problem, give us three days, okay? So they can raise money quickly, issue securities quickly, they buy, sell quickly, extremely fast. Associated or caused or uh, allowed to happen by technology and computerization allows for lightning fast speed. Another characteristic is, oh, try and see how to make this uh, be, okay, we'll write it. Conglomerates, conglomerates. Financial conglomerates is a financial institution that offers a large number of service of different financial services. They offer commercial banking services and credit cards and brokerages and insurance investment banking, whatever the financial services, they offer these most or all of them, okay? So financial conglomerate is kind of like one-stop shop. Back in the old days, for marketing purposes, they called it financial supermarket. You can come to us, we'll give you anything. Life insurance, okay. Car insurance, okay. Health insurance, okay. Stocks, okay. Bonds, okay, all right? Investments, okay, mutual funds, okay. Whatever you want, they will offer it to you. So this has been an important trend in the United States and also other European countries. I'm not sure about Japan. I think that in Japan they have always been conglomerates, okay? But in the US, you have this trend. In Europe, you also have this trend, okay? I'm not sure, actually quite familiar about Asia, exact how things work in here. All right, yeah, derivatives, nine. Recent decades, the last two or three decades, have resulted in phenomenal growth of derivatives. Derivatives have grown thousands of times, tens of thousands of times, from a tiny little market to a beast that is bigger than all other markets taken together, which when it collapses will collapse the whole global financial system eventually, all right? It's has grown like many, many, many times bigger than all other markets taken together, okay? In derivatives, carry with them phenomenal leverage and they carry with them meaning with the leverage you always have risk now let's define a brand new term which is not uh, usually uh, used in finance. Let's just use the term uh, and explain what is 
because we study risk like 10 different types of risk. Let's call one more, financial risk. And financial risk is simply risk associated with debt and leverage. Okay? So debt and leverage cause or create or increase financial risk. Okay? So back to derivatives. Modern derivatives have resulted in the increase of financial risk in the global financial markets and global financial institutions. They have rising financial risk. And number 10, the last one is to complete for today, speculation. The most important or one of the most important or one of the top 10 important trends in the last 130s in financial market is the rise of speculation. Everyone is speculator now. They speculate in oil, they speculate in gold. Of course, they speculate in real estate in the US, before that in Japan, all over Europe, in most of China, right here in Taiwan. It's kind of like, oh, Hong Kong, heated, hot real estate bubble, okay? Uh, I don't know about Singapore. So, you got real estate speculation, and of course in Australia, and of course in the UK, and of course before that we had it in Ireland, and in Iceland, and all the and of course in Greece, in my home Bulgaria, everywhere, giant real estate speculation, massive real estate bubbles, most of them burst, many banking system already down, you know, half bankrupt, and bailed out by governments, now resulting in government bankruptcies, so speculation is also with currencies. Oh, it has been recently with government bonds of Italy, Spain, of weak European countries, which resulted in the latest, it's called MF Global, Man Financial Global, okay, which was a major broker. They were handling funds for their own account and for their customers. And when they started losing money and were short on money from their own, when they lost their own money, they started taking out of their customers. We call this stealing. They were stealing money from their customers until they ran out of their customers' money too. Okay? And when they ran out of money, they went bankrupt. Okay? So, that was a result of speculating with European bonds, which went wrong, meaning which went bad. They suffered losses. And that's just one example. But as I said, they speculate with it. They speculate with bonds, of course, with stocks, of course, with currencies, with commodities. Uh, most importantly, speculation with derivatives, with futures, with options. You name an investment with real estate, they speculate with it, okay? And why there is a mess of speculation? Because speculation, as we clarified in the previous course, is coming with borrowed money. And when you speculate with other people's money, we call it in finance leveraged speculation. Leveraged speculation. So, leveraged speculation is speculating in the markets with other people's money or we call it with leverage and the leverage may be also in the form of futures of options of derivatives and so on and these are the top 10 most important trends in global financial markets let's say over the last 30 years and up to the point of the global financial crisis in 2008 since then it's a whole new page which we cover in our other course.